Good morning. Today I'm going to do a reading from a mailing that I received from the Carl Jung Depth Psychology site blog. Um, I get these every day uh, from my friend Louis LaFontaine who uh, publishes them. And uh, this one I thought was very important. It begins with this particular image that you can see on the screen right now, which is the oldest known icon of Christ Pantocrator, which is from the St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai. And you can see the two different facial expressions on either side to emphasize Christ's dual nature as both divine and human. Now, to learn something about St. Catherine's Monastery, let me just show you a picture. This monastery is placed at the foot of Mount Sinai in the Sinai Peninsula of Egypt. And it has existed for many hundreds of years, many over a thousand years, I believe. And I first learned about it from a uh, Muslim Egyptian friend of mine, and he was going to go there on his honeymoon. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> that's just an interesting side story about this particular monastery. So let's see, I guess I can put the icon back up on the screen and share it while I read this article, which is uh, a piece of volume 11 of the collected works of C.G. Jung, Psychology and Religion. This is reading from paragraphs 226 to 233. The Trinity and its inner life process, the Trinity and its inner life process. Oh, I guess I should have said that this is a behind the scenes reading, so I will be correcting my reading from time to time uh, because I won't have edited it. So this is a live, what you see is what you get <laughs> reading. Um, anyway, um, the Trinity and its inner life process appears as a closed circle, a self-contained divine drama in which man plays at most a passive part. It seizes on him and, for a period of several centuries, forced him to occupy his mind passionately with all sorts of problems which today seem incredibly abstruse if not downright absurd, which today seem incredibly abstruse, which today seem incredibly abstruse, if not downright absurd. It is, in f it is in the first place difficult to see what the Trinity could possibly mean for us, either practically, morally, or symbolically. Even theologians often feel that speculation on this subject is a more or less idle juggling with ideas, and there are not a few who could not, and there are not a few who could get along quite comfortably without the divinity of Christ, and for whom the role of the Holy Ghost, both inside and outside the Trinity, is an embarrassment of the first order. Writing of the Athanasian Creed has abjured the laws of human thought. Naturally, the only person who can talk like that is one who is no longer impressed by the revelation of holiness and has fallen back on his own mental activity. This, this so far as the revealed archetype is concerned, is an inevitably retrograde step. The liberalistic humanization of Christ goes back to the rival doctrine of 
homoousia and to Arianism, while modern anti while modern anti Trinitarianism has a conception of God that is more Old Testament or Islamic in character than Christian. Obviously, anyone who approaches this problem with rationalistic and intellect and intellectualist and intellectualistic assumptions like D.F. Strauss is bound to find the patristic discussions and arguments completely nonsensical, but that anyone, and especially a theologian, should fall back on such manifestly incommensurable criteria as reason, logic, and the like, shows that despite all the mental exertions of the councils and of scholastic theology, they failed to bequeath to posterity an intellectual understanding of the dogma that would lend the slightest support to belief in it. There remained only submission to faith and renunciation of one's own desire to understand. Faith, as we know from experience, often comes off second best and has to give, and has to give in to criticism, which may not at all, and has to give in to criticism, which may not be at all qualified to deal with the object of faith. Criticism of this kind always puts on an air of great enlightenment, that is to say, it spreads round itself that thick darkness which the word once tried to penetrate with its light, quote, and the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not." Unquote. Naturally, it never occurs to these critics that their way of approach is incommensurable with their project. They think they have to do with, they think they have to do with rational facts, whereas it entirely escapes them that it is and always has been primarily a question of irrational psychic phenomena. That this is so can be easily, that this is so can be seen plainly enough for the unhistorical character of the Gospels, whose only concern was to represent the miraculous figure of Christ as graphically and impressively as possible. Further evidence of this is supplied by the earliest literary witness, Paul, who was closer to the events in question than the apostles. It is frankly disappointing to see how Paul hardly ever allows the real Jesus of Nazareth to get in a word. Even at this early date, and not only in John, he is completely overlaid, or rather smothered, by metaphysical conceptions. He is the ruler over all demonic forces, the cosmic savior, the mediating God-man. The whole pre-Christian and Gnostic theology of the Near East, some of whose roots go still further back, wraps itself about him and turns him before our eyes into a dogmatic figure who has no more need of historic, who has no more need of historic, who has no more need of historicity. At a very early stage, therefore, the real Christ vanished behind the emotions and projections that swarmed about him from far and near. Immediately and almost without trace, he was absorbed into the surrounding religious systems and molded into their archetypal exponent. He became the collective figure whom the unconscious of his contemporaries expected to appear, and for this reason it is pointless to ask who he really was. Were he human and nothing else, and in this sense historic and in this sense historically true, he would probably be no more enlightening a figure than, say, Pythagoras or Socrates or Apollonius of Tirana. He opened men's eyes to revelation precisely because he was from everlasting God. He opened men's eyes to revelation precisely because he was from everlasting God 
and therefore unhistorical, and he functioned as such only by virtue of the consensus of unconscious expectation. If nobody had remarked that there was something special about the wonder-working rabbi from Galilee, the darkness would never have noticed that a light was shining. Whether he lit the light with his own strength or whether he was the victim of the universal longing for light and broke down under it are questions which, for lack of reliable information, only faith can decide. At any rate, the documentary reports relating to the general projection and assimilation of the Christ figure are unequivocal. There is plenty of evidence for the cooperation of the collective unconscious in view of the abundance of parallels from the history of religion. In these circumstances, we must ask ourselves what it was in man that was stirred by the Christian message and what was the answer he gave? If we are to answer this psychological question, we must first we must first of all examine the Christ, we must first of all examine the Christ symbolism contained in the New Testament, together with the patristic allegories and medieval iconography and the medieval iconography together with the patristic allegories and medieval iconography and compare this material with the archetypal content of the unconscious psyche in order to find out what archetypes have been constellated. The most important of the symbolic the most important of the symbolical statements about Christ are those which reveal the attributes of the hero's life improbable origin, divine father, hazardous birth, rescue in a nick of time, precocious development, conquest of the mother and of death, miraculous deeds, a tragic early end, symbolically significant manner of death, post-mortem effects, reappearances, signs and marvels, etc. As the Logos, son of the Father, Rex Gloriae, Judex Mundi, Redeemer and Savior, Christ is himself God, an all-embracing totality, which, like the definition of the Godhead, is expressed iconographic, which is expressed, is expressed iconographically by the circle or mandala. Here I would mention only here I would mention only the traditional representation of the Rex Gloriae in a mandala, accompanied by a quaternity composed of the four symbols of the evangelist, including the four seasons, four winds, four rivers, and so on. Another symbolism of the same kind is the choir of saints angels and elders grouped round Christ, or God, in the center. Here, Christ symbolizes the integration of the kings and prophets of the Old Testament. As a shepherd, he is the leader and center of the flock. He is the vine, and those that hang on him are the branches. His body is bread to be eaten, and his blood wine to be drunk. He is also the mystical body formed by the congregation. In his human manifestation, he is the hero and God-man, born without sin, more complete and more perfect than the natural man. These mythological statements coming from within the Christian sphere as well as from outside foreshadow an archetype that expresses itself in essentially the same symbolism and also occurs in individual dreams or in fantasy-like projections upon living people, Trans transference phenomena, hero worship, etc. The content of all such symbolic products is the idea of an overpowering, 
all embracing complete and complete or perfect being represented either by a man of represented either by a man of heroic proportions or by an animal with magical attributes or by a magical vessel or some other geometrically like the like the mandala the archetype <clears throat> The archetypal idea is a reflection of the individual's wholeness, i.e. of the self, which is present in him as an unconscious image. The conscious mind can form absolutely no conception of this totality. The, <clears throat> <clears throat> because it includes not only the conscious, but also the unconscious psyche, which is as such inconceivable and irrepresentable. It was this archetype of the self in the soul of every man that responded to the Christian message, with the result that the concrete Rabbi Jesus was rapidly assimilated, was rapidly assimilated by the constellated archetype. In this way, Christ realized the idea of the self, but as one can never distinguish empirically between a symbol of the self and a God image, the two ideas, however much we try to differentiate them, always appear blended together. That the self appears synonymous with the inner Christ of the Johannine and Pauline writings and Christ with God of one substance with the Father, just as the Atman appears as the individualized self and at the same time as the animating principle of the cosmos, and Tao as a condition of mind and at the same time as the correct behavior of cosmic events. Psychologically speaking, the domain of gods begins where consciousness leaves off. For at that point, man is already at the mercy of the natural order, whether he thrive or perish. To the symbols of wholeness that come to him from there, he attaches names which vary according to time and place. <clears throat> the self is defined the self is defined psychologically as the psychic totality of the individual. Anything that a man postulates as being a greater totality than himself can become a symbol of the self. For this reason, the symbol of the self is not always as total as the definition would require. Even the Christ figure is not a totality, for it lacks the nocturnal side of the psyche's nature, the darkness of the spirit, and it also and is also without sin. Without the integration of evil, there is no totality, nor can evil be added to the mixture by force. One could compare Christ as a symbol to the mean. One could compare Christ as a symbol to the mean of the first mixture. One could compare Christ as a symbol to the mean of the first mixture. He would then be the middle term of a triad in which the one and indivisible is represented by the Father and the divisible by the Holy Ghost, who, as we know, can divide himself into tongues of fire. But this triad, according to the, the Timaeus, is not yet a reality. Consequent, consequently, a second mixture is needed. The goal of psychological as of biological development is self-realization or individuation. But since man knows himself only as an ego, the self as a totality is indescribable and indistinguishable from a God image. Self-realization, self to put it in religious and metaphysical terms, amounts to God's incarnation. 
that is already expressed in the fact that Christ is the Son of God, and because individuation is an heroic and often tragic task, the most difficult of all, it involves suffering, a passion of the ego. The ordinary empirical man we once were, the ordinary empirical man we once were is bored. Sorry. The ordinary empirical man we once were is burdened with the fate of losing himself in a greater dimension and being robbed of his fancy, and being robbed of his fancied freedom of will. He suffers, so to speak, from the violence done to him by the self. The analogous passion of Christ signifies God's suffering on account of the injustice of the world and the darkness of man. The human and the divine suffering set up a relationship of complementarity and the human and the divine suffering set up a relationship of complementarity with compensating effects. Through the Christ symbol through the Christ symbol man can get to know the real meaning of his suffering. He is on the way towards realizing his wholeness. As a result of the integration, as a result of the integration of conscious and unconscious, his ego enters the divine realm where it participates in God's suffering. The cause of the suffering is in both cases the same, namely incarnation which on the human level appears as individuation. The divine hero born of man is already threatened with murder. He has nowhere to lay his head, and his death is a gruesome tragedy. The self is no mere concept of logical postulate. It is the psychic reality, only part of it conscious, while for the rest it embraces the life of the unconscious and is therefore inconceivable except in the form of symbols. The drama of the archetypal life of Christ describes in symbolic images the events in the conscious life as well as in the life that transcends consciousness of a man who has been transformed by his higher destiny. Okay, that completes the reading. I thought I would say a few things about this. I want to go back and reread a couple of these sentences to help discuss them. Um, okay, one of them is um, Dr. Jung is saying that the councils and scholastic theology, through all of their mental exertions, failed to bequeath to posterity an intellectual understanding of the dogma that would lend the slightest support to belief in it. and therefore it has to give in to criticism, which may not be at all qualified to deal with the object of faith. So what he's referring to is the fact that early Christians relied on magic, basically. They uh, described what was happening to them and what happened to Christ as magical events. And when the scientific method came along, most of those magical descriptions were um, debunked and were found to be not true. Okay, so what does that mean for religions? Well, um, myths are, uh, religious myths are untrue to the extent that they don't fulfill the requirements of the scientific method, but they are true as they are methods of sex, they are methods of self-actualization and mental health and a way of carrying psycho or a way of carrying spiritual values through to the next generation. And so 
you know, if you know an atheist who wants to throw religions out with the bathwater, you might point out that they also are methods of self-actualization and they were spontaneously developed systems of mental health going back thousands of years and they did successfully carry our societal values regardless of what society we're talking about and so you know in terms of of um the scientific method and what religions are telling you about after death my um my atheist side says that when you're dead, you don't know you're dead. It's only difficult for your family. When you're stupid, it works the same way. Okay, so that's what I would say as an atheist about life after death. And um, one time my father was very near death in 1998. <clears throat> And he was in the hospital. He had gone down to 112 pounds. And he was lying in bed looking very worried and almost cadaver-like. And I said to him, what are you worried about? And he said, well, I'm worried about kicking the bucket. And I said, well, don't worry about that. We've got... It. I, I used the, the number, <clears throat> I said, 7.5 billion people have tried it and we've got no complaints. Uh, some of my subscribers then rejected my number and it turns out that the number of human beings that have lived in all times is approximately 108 billion or something like that. So at this point, 108 billion human beings have tried death and we have no complaints. But that doesn't mean that religions are wrong because the spirit does live on. It certainly lives on in your children in the sense of they having been educated by you and it lives on it may live on in the internet in terms of something like this video or something you write or some poem you write or some other note that you leave or a painting that you paint or any other such creative work uh, your spirit lives on in those is carried forward in those and so dr young was very insistent that we have to live this life. We can't put off living our life into the hereafter. We have to live this life, and if our spirit is going to live on, it's going to li live on through the things we leave behind. And, you know, um, so anyway, my point is that atheists throw the, out the baby with the bathwater because, okay, so the magical conceptions of early Iron Maid age men were not correct. We now know that. But what is correct is that these were spontaneously developed systems of mental hygiene or mental health long before there was a Freud or a Jung. And so they do work and they provide for self-actualization. Now, what the, does Dr. Jung mean by that? <clears throat> well, um, as we grow up, obviously, each of our bodies has within it a heart and lungs and a brain and fingers and so on. So our physical body knows how to become a human being. It, that require, that's done entirely unconsciously, and we have no need to take part in it other than what we put into it. And, and so if we treat it properly these days, we can live to be over 100 years old. Um, and Dr. Jung's point is that self-actualization also occurs in the psyche. 
and so so there are like four levels of people there are atheists who want to throw the baby out with the bathwater for the wrong reasons there are agnostics who just don't want to know they don't uh, make a judgment either way they don't want to get into an argument with their fellow men <clears throat> and so they just ride along without even thinking about it then there are religious people and if it works for them it works um, but the question that really engages society is what is god's will and what is political will within humanity in other words how are religions being used for purposes in this life that are not god's will and what do we need to correct what do we need to do to correct um, what do we need to do to correct that that's the question and then um, beyond religious of course there was the famous interview with dr young that you can find here on youtube you can do a search on Carl Jung, I have no need to know, and you can find that video right away. And so what did he mean by that? What he meant by that is that he was self-realized. And when you're self-realized, you don't have any need to believe because you do know, and you know, um, what you're realized as and what your purpose in life is. Now, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't continue to be a religious person, because as I've pointed out, religions of all types have served humanity for thousands of years as spontaneously developed systems of mental health. And so they are helpful to us. I'm, have said a few times on this channel that years ago when I was a deacon in the Reformed Church, which is the same church that Dr. Jung was brought up in, except that Dr. Jung was Swiss Reformed and my Reformed Church was based on Dutch Reformed. But aside from that, um, I was a deacon, but I had the usual questions that young people have about, you know, what's this Christianity thing all about? But I kept those questions to myself pretty much. I asked, I one time asked the pastor what his conception of God was. And all I know about his conception was that it was completely unmemorable. <laughs> but what I do acknowledge is that when I would go to church every Sunday, after I had been to church and through the ritual of the church of a one hour service, I would feel better. And so I have to acknowledge now in retrospect that going to that one hour on a Sunday morning was helpful to me and it made me feel more um, solid in my way of being in the world and so on and so I can you know personally vouch for the value of attending uh, services leaving aside the the atheistic criticisms which uh, at this point in time, after years and years of study of Dr. Jung's work, I now realize that the, athe the atheistic criticisms are simply hogwash, that uh, yes, they are correct in the sense that the magical statements of religions are not true, fine, but they are wrong in the sense that religions have served a societal purpose for thousands of years and they still provide a societal purpose in the form of mental health and in the form of passing societal values 
down the ages and also in the form of self-actualization, if you know that, if you understand what I'm saying by that. So, um, let me see what else I would have commented on here. So, uh, Dr. Jung is also basically saying the same thing as I've just said when he says, they think they, and he's referring to atheists here, uh, they think they have to do with rational facts, whereas it entirely escapes them that it is and always has been primarily a question of irrational psychic phenomena. That this is so can be seen plainly enough from the unhistorical character of the Gospels, whose only concern was to represent the miraculous figure of Christ as graphically and impressively as possible. And so, if you go back and read the Bible with this basic idea in mind, you'll see what I mean. Um, <clears throat> And then Dr. Jung has said, um, the Christian and Gnostic theology of the Near East wraps itself about him and turns him before our eyes into a dogmatic figure who has no more need for historicity. Well, so what they thought they were doing and what they did do and maybe it was necessary at the time we're talking about 2000 years ago was to create this dogmatic figure the only trouble is that when the scientific method came along uh, the dogma got a little frayed and so that's the issue that we're having to face today in these debates between people like Dr. Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris. Um, so anyway, Dr. Jung's point is that the prefigurations for Christ have been developing for at least a thousand years in Judaism. And if you read his book, Answer to Job, you'll see exactly what I mean. And specifically, Answer to Job appears in paragraphs 553 to 758 of volume 11 of the collected works of uh, Dr. C.G. Young, so it's the same reference as we have for this video. Um, and so you can find in there, in paragraph 752, Dr. Young's simple statement that every religious statement without exception is a statement of the psyche and not a statement of the physical world. And the problem of the debate as it's currently put out into the world is that is exactly that that the atheists want to argue against religion based on the physical world and dr young clearly says if it was in the physical world it would be treated in the books of natural science but it isn't because Every religious statement is a statement of the psyche. And so, um, in order to have understood what it was I was saying for the last 45 minutes or so, uh, you certainly have to understand what Dr. Jung meant from a psychological point of view by the concept of archetype. And so archetypes are the deepest layers of the human psyche, and they are the patterns by which we spontaneously develop uh, both physically and um, 
psychologically, emotionally, and but they simply lie there until they're constellated, which means they're there in every single human being, but until something activates them and still something turns them on, they're just potential. They're not they're not active in any human being. And uh, the example would be the mother archetype where as soon as a mother, as soon as a woman becomes a mother, she's instantly a mother and all her instincts push her in that direction for the rest of her life. Um, and so what Dr. Jung is saying is that the self archetype was constellated in Jesus Christ. And so that archetype played through during his lifetime. Um, and so, um, let's see. And so the one other point is that the conscious mind can form absolutely no conception of this totality of the self. Um, and that's what studying Jungian psychology does for me is that it gives me greater and greater and greater understanding of this self archetype, this God image archetype, which is the deepest archetype in my psyche and in every human being's psyche. And uh, when, when Dr. Jung in this is saying that um, Christ is an incomplete representation of the self. It's because in Jungian psychology, everything operates based on opposites. And his point through several of his books is that the Christian church ignored evil. They spoke about the privatio boni, which means the privation of good uh, instead of talking about evil as a real entity. And his point was that it was only in the 20th century that we could see that evil is a great power and it can overwhelm us. So, excuse me. So, um, so the point is that in order to have wholeness uh, for humanity, uh, we have to understand the evil that is within us and within our societies and then try to find balance of that. And Christianity tried for 2,000 years to use this concept of privatio boni, so they put their thumb down on the good side of the scale. But the problem is when evil finally constellates, as it certainly did in the 20th century, where we had 175 million people killed in world wars and other wars, um, then we have to recognize that evil is a great power just as much as good. And then we have to figure out how to integrate it and bring it into our society. We could look at our current situation in the United States politically, the red state, blue state duality, where the reality is that in order to have wholeness of the United States for us as Americans to be all one people, we have to find a way to integrate the other side of the debate into our own lives and into our society. How do we do that? I, you know, to quote Jeffrey Rush in Shakespeare and Love, I don't know, it's a mystery, but we have to find a way to do that. And so, you know, we have to look at our country and decide who is helping us 
unite so that we are the United States of America and who is dividing us. Because as long as we're divided, we're going to have every bit as much trouble as someone with neurosis or even psychosis has. So I mean that as a people, of the American people, as a people are going to continue to be neurotic and or psychotic until we see that what needs to be done is that we need to be a united people. And that means everybody. It means everybody of every race, color, religion, country of national origin, whatever it is, everybody that is living in this country has to be included and integrated into the system in order for the United States to be whole. Now, the good news is that, in my view, the reason that the United States has become the most powerful country in the world is because we do debate and we do um, we don't respect other people putting their finger down on the scale on either side. And so what happens is that we adopt every good idea that comes up from everyone, regardless of what group good ideas come from, we adopt them. And to a limited extent, that happens around the world. Um, and my example for that would be uh, Starbucks, which obviously most Americans have embraced as a good idea. And Starbucks was founded by a man who's known as a Zionist. And even though that is true, regardless of his religious persuasion and attitude, um, Starbucks has been adopted throughout the Middle East, for example, and I used to work in the largest hospital in Saudi Arabia. And in that hospital, there were four Starbucks cafes in the building. And so that's an example of a good idea that was adopted around the world. We could also talk about McDonald's as an example, although we can argue about whether McDonald's is a good idea <laughs> when you when you see the physique of the people that work in McDonald's, you have to wonder. But the reality is that McDonald's, the idea of a fast food restaurant and McDonald's being first in was an idea that was good enough for people around the world. And so regardless of where you go in the world, you'll very likely find a McDonald's restaurant. And I remember being very surprised when I was in uh, Tiananmen Square in Beijing, uh, the same square where the young man was stopping the line of tanks by standing in front of them in that square. Um, and standing in front of the Imperial Palace and looking out into the square, you can actually see a golden arches there. And so, <laughs> so there's an idea that gets adopted around the world too. Uh, and the same could be said of Burger King or Pizza Hut or many others. Um, and the internet, uh, obviously the internet itself has been adopted by people around the world. And as Hosni Mubarak discovered during the Arab Spring, um, we are now entirely dependent upon the internet to keep going. Uh, he, he thought he would stop the Arab Spring by shutting down the internet in Egypt. And when he did that, bread wasn't getting delivered to bakeries <laughs> and and so he was forced to turn it back on and so that just demonstrates if that's happening in egypt that would happen everywhere that we are all dependent upon the internet which we've all adopted if we're watching this video and so 
that's what happens when good ideas come up in the United States. When bad ideas come up, we argue them out of the system very noisily. Um, fortunately, we do that mostly peaceably. We don't do it with violence and weapons these days, but we do it with lots and lots of logical argument, which we see on our cable news channels every single day. And uh, people in other countries don't understand us. They just cannot understand how or why we put up with these incessant arguments on our television screen. But it's those incessant arguments that are the tempering of the steel, the way we're forcing the impurities out of our system. Whereas in other countries, ideas are suppressed. And when good ideas are suppressed um, from whatever side, then your country doesn't do so well. And so you really have to have free and strenuous debate in order for your country to rise to the level that it should be. And so that's the way it works. And so anyway, that's uh, probably the end of my homily for today, but I'll look back here and see what comments I have on the chat. Uh, Miles says, I like mental hygiene as a phrase. It is those things we do daily or weekly to preserve mental health as I brush my teeth to give me dental health. Um, well, uh, as you may remember from Monday night, <laughs> uh, Miles, uh, Bill from our local group uh, objected to the term hygiene because he sounded it, he said it sounded so, um, so hospital-like. And so I think I'm going to change the way I say it to mental health, that there are systems for mental health uh, rather than hygiene. Okay, which sounds, sounds like somebody's using antiseptic in the hospital, which I do agree with Bill on that point. Uh, and uh, Lacri Lacrima Mosa Est says hi, and I'm saying hi. Uh, the Gr Grenade says, what if I don't trust cable news? Um, well, you don't have to trust cable news because cable news is going to be whether you trust it or not. And so, uh, and it is doing something of purpose, which is we're constantly evolving as a country, which means that like you, we have many young people who are always coming up through the system and they have to be experienced in the ways of our country. And so just because you know everything, probably you think that at this point in your life, uh, just because you know everything doesn't mean everybody has because, um, you know, there are lots of young people today who were not alive at 9-11 and they're in high school today. And so they don't understand what happened emotionally at that point in time. Uh, and there's very few people today that understand what happened emotionally at the time of Pearl Harbor, for example. And so those young people have to be uh, brought along and educated. And the, it's inevitable that we're going to have opposites. And when they get out of balance, they do balance. They, un, they ultimately balance. It doesn't, it's not something that happens in a week or a, or a year. It happens in multiple years. And so if, if there are some Americans who are incensed by our current administration, what I can say without equivocation is that that will balance itself out. It's not necessarily going to balance itself out in one election, which we're going to have in November, but the worse things get, 
the more they're going to be pushed to balance in the other direction. So it really doesn't matter what cable news station you watch uh, on the left or the right, because they're simply trying to pound their side of the opposite into your head, just as the Christian church tried to pound the idea of good into the head of Western Europeans for 2,000 years. But ultimately, the imbalance got corrected in the 20th century in a very, very bloody way. And so, um, so now we have to learn how to integrate that and what it means to have um, someone like a Hitler who could cause a psychic epi epidemic that would destroy Western Europe. You know, basically, when evil emerges, it has to be, it has to be stamped out root and branch. And if it's not, if that doesn't happen, then it can emerge again. And so in the case of Western Europe and in the case of Japan, the evil was, wasn't gone. And the case of Italy, too, where uh, fascists were in power in those countries, the evil wasn't gone until all the crockery was broken. And after it was all broken and stamped out root and branch, then um, something new could emerge in all those countries. And all of them are among the United States' best allies today. And so we have to understand how we learn and how we balance these things. Um, Vincent says, I love your channel. Thank you very much, Vincent. Grenade says, I just use the internet for info, but I never watch Fox or CNN or any others. That's fine. Uh, if you're coming here, I don't know if you're going to get news here. <laughs> um, and uh, Grenad says, I guess I use fake news. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. It's up to you. Uh, each of us has two streams coming up from our psyche. Uh, one stream is good and one stream is evil. And it is once we get into the ego, into our conscious ego, that we have to make a selection between good and evil. And it's our responsibility to make that selection. And uh, we can express it in the voting booth every couple of years, one way or another. And so you know, it's, it's you that has to decide what is true and what is false. And, um, you know, I acknowledge that fake news comes up on both sides and each one of us has to make our own decision. And this was Dr. Jung's point that, um, the development of human society came up first through um, or at least in the West, came up through Judaism and the rule of law, law first, which was the Ten Commandments at the time of Moses, where, where we're talking about something that happened about 1,200 years before Christ. And then when Christ came along, it, it changed, and there was a transformation into belief and that was a belief in good and putting your thumb down on the scale to make everything good, except the only problem is that that evil still existed and it wasn't balanced in the society. And so you can imagine in France, let's say, where they were building Chartres or uh, the Cathedral of Notre Dame, uh, those cathedrals took a hundred years to build. And as long as people were building those, they had meaning in their life and they were building towards something that was based on belief. But 
now at the 21st century, we know that the stories that the people were told at the time of building of those cathedrals uh, don't hold water in a lot of ways. And so we have to have something new, and that's a psychological way of thinking about the world. So as I've said earlier today, um, it doesn't mean that we're going to ignore religion. Religions are true, and they're true as psychic facts, and they have been organically developed systems for mental health um, for thousands of years. And that's true of all of them, not only Christianity. And we have to, instead of figuring out how to convince our fellow men about why their religion is wrong and ours is right, it's time for us to get together and see what is right in other people's ways of looking at the world and in their religion. And so I often say that, you know, if we look at Islam, you know, what could be wrong with praying five times a day? You know, just taking a time out for 15 minutes a day and just praying uh, what's wrong with that? That's a that's an idea we could adopt from Islam, and um, with Buddhism, um, Buddhism is about um, about the self, the self end of the ego self axis, and uh, so what's wrong with tranquil bliss and the idea of meditation per se, and putting oneself in the vicinity of tranquil bliss, which would be the extreme end of, of that um, scale. And so we can all learn from all these religions and how they've worked with, with us. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Tom Clement says, why do you think it is that some cultures readily accept the idea that God can take human form, Odin, Christ, or Krishna, but other cultures, Judaism and Islam, fiercely reject it. Um, well, I think that they developed in different ways by uh, different shamans and priests and so on. And so what Dr. Jung pointed out, and I discussed earlier this week, so it's on the top of this YouTube channel, uh, Christ and Buddha are on two ends of a, a spectrum. And let me get this Christ image off the screen so I can show you. Okay, so Christ is here and Buddha is here. And so Christ is about the ego side of the spectrum and Buddha is on the self end of the spectrum. And so how they developed, they developed in different ways along that spectrum. That's all. So, um, you know, if, if uh, you ask what is my ethnic heritage, uh, you know, in my family, we like to say we're Dutch, but the truth is that we're not. Uh, we're on a spectrum as the Ancestry.com uh, advertisements every day on television clearly tell us and in my just in my grandparents generation four different grandparents we have Swedish Welsh Dutch and German and so so I don't actually know on the spectrum whether I'm more or less Dutch than other Americans I know that a lot of my ancestors in the first 200 years that uh, my European ancestors were in North America, um, they were largely uh, from Holland and therefore Dutch. And I don't know from before that. Um, but just like that, all these religions developed on a spectrum. And um, if you start to look into them, you'll 
gradually understand which ones are on the self end of the spectrum, which tends to be the Eastern religions, Taoism, Hinduism, Buddhism, and so on. Uh, Jainism is another one. And which ones are on the ego end of the spectrum, which is uh, Christianity, uh, Islam, and Judaism, I think. Um, and uh, obviously these were early Iron Age people who were trying to describe the phenomena in their world uh, before they, humans as a group, had developed all these wonderful technologies that we have today and so they had to come up with some explanation and so some of them came up with um, you know the idea of a, a of a god figure of, of the figure of god touching adam's finger in the uh, ceiling of the sistine Cha chapel as um, Michelangelo uh, portrayed it. Okay, I think that's a perception of lots of people in the West. Just that that image that's on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, and so lots of people after Michelangelo adopted his way of thinking about it. But that doesn't mean that there is, in fact, a being somewhere up there who's a puppeteer and is going to make you make the great touchdown on your high school football team. That isn't what happens at all. Um, and so those football players that point up ought to be pointing at their heart. Um, and so to the extent I can answer that question, Tom, that's my, the best I can do for today. Uh, and Grant says, I just fear the political ideology is trying to replace the vacuum that religion used to occupy. Well, surely it is. And, and so we have lots of religions uh, that come up in one way or another. Um, you know, the computers I use and the smartphone I use happen to be apples. And so, you know, adopting the apple religion today at, uh, let's see, 1 p.m. today, uh, Apple is going to announce its new iPhones, and I will be busy uh, preparing for my, uh, my advanced reading group at that time, which our meeting is at 1.30, and we're talking about uh, ion researches into the phenomenology of the self, and it so happens that in today's group, we're talking about chapter seven of that book, which is a is about Nostradamus. And so uh, if you join the advanced reading group, you'll have access to the video of that meeting. Uh, or if you're a member of the group, you can um, be with us this afternoon. It's done on Zoom, so it's a live video conference. Um, so there are lots of people that are selling lots of religions, and it from a psychological point of view, Dr. Jung emphasized that we have to start looking psychologically and decide inside ourselves what is right and what is wrong. Um, okay, so I have to move along because I have another class to prepare for. And so I wish you all well. And um, just a reminder that beginning Monday night, September 17th, at our 8 o'clock Eastern Time hour in the regular reading group on Mondays, we will be discussing um, dreams and we'll be discussing, uh, I think it's five essays over a period of weeks. Um, which appear in a book that's entitled Dreams by C.G. Jung. Uh, the uh, the reissue of it after the Red Book um, was published in 2010. So that's the edition we'll be using. But what that 
book does is it simply is a compendium of five essays that Dr. Young wrote over his lifetime, which appear in four different volumes of the collected works. So I'll be talking about that starting next Monday, and I look forward to seeing you all sometime in the future. Take care. I'm going to sign off now with apologies. It's nice to have so many people here today, though.